In the shadow of Toronto, at the western end of Lake Ontario, lies the city of Hamilton. Known as Steeltown, this city has had the title of industrial capital of Canada for over a century. Until March 1994, it also had the distinction of being one of the few cities in North America to have an electric bus system. This video chronicles more than a century of Hamilton's electric transit history with the only known streetcar film in existence, as well as never seen before Canadian car Brill and Flyer trolley coach films. Fictional Operator 399 provides recollections of this bygone era with both motorman and bus driver anecdotes. The Hamilton Street Railway was incorporated as a private franchise in 1873. In the summer of 1874, the first horse cars began operating on three miles of track on James and King Streets. By 1890, the HSR had 12 miles of service track, and by the summer of 1892, electrification of the system began, three months before Toronto. New equipment was ordered. To keep costs down, the old horse car bodies were remodeled and placed on new electric trucks. On June 29, 1892, a converted horse car, similar to this, with its gong clanging, packed to the roof with riders, sailed around the corner of King and James, much to the delight of hundreds gathered in the streets, signaling the beginning of the electric transit era in Hamilton. While the HSR ran a number of single truck open cars for excursions, 1894 provincial legislation required installation of closed vestibules on their other cars for the comfort and protection of the crews. By the turn of the century, the HSR was controlled by a power company that supplied cheap hydroelectric power for the running of the system. In response to several tragic accidents, Sleeman life-saving catchers were installed on the cars to prevent people from falling under the wheels. As time passed, the condition of the second-hand cars from Brooklyn, Cleveland, and Boston became a constant source of complaints from passengers, and new equipment was soon ordered. By 1912, 36 Ottawa and Preston Car Company built vehicles arrived for service. A typical car was equipped with longitudinal rattan covered bench seats. Standees could grab onto leather straps suspended from the ceiling to brace themselves as the car swayed down the track. These were rear entrance cars, but as time passed, the HSR adjusted its boarding procedures. Because of the variety of equipment on its roster, riders had to be observant as to which car was coming, so that they could enter through the correct door. The Hamilton Street rail system expanded slowly, and on a small scale until the 1920s. New track was added, and older lines were extended. This early 30s track map shows the system at its zenith. Interlaced with city rail were radial tracks that linked Hamilton with other cities. These lines would later be abandoned because of dwindling patronage due to the building of paved highways for the growing number of private automobiles. The city, however, was planning a renewal of the system. The largely second-hand fleet had to be replaced. In 1926, the city renewed the HSR franchise, and after heated negotiations, a deal was signed for 48 new locally built streetcars to be delivered over the subsequent three years. In addition, a track renewal program began. In 1928, the HSR consolidated operations in a new east barn located on Wentworth Street, sharing track briefly with the radial cars. And two years later, the HSR was purchased by Ontario Hydro. The new 500 series cars eventually typified the HSR's fleet. The lightweight steel body construction was rugged, and they were similar in design to other cars of the period. They were built for either one-man or two-man operation, and ran on the Beltline and Burlington James South routes for most of their service life. In 1947, the Buffalo chapter of the NRHS chartered two 500 series cars for a tour of the double-track part of the system. Art Ellis of Pittsburgh filmed the charter from the window of the lead car. 
A little hard to distinguish in these movies, the original paint was olive green and cream above the belt rail, with a terracotta roof and cherry wood folding doors. Further along, a stop was made at the car house, and the charter group transferred to two double-ended 400 series cars for a trip on the single track portion of the system. Operator 399 relates what could very well have been told to the captive tour group on that Sunday afternoon so long ago. One winter day it was cold, damn cold. Roads were icy, slippery, snow covered, and I went to pull out to turn onto James Street. And you know the truck, the wheels, they're, they're back behind you. So the car doesn't turn right away. But I kept getting closer and closer to the stores across the street and nothing was happening. So I stopped and I find the switch is full of ice. I come right out and rolled across the pavement. So, rookie that I was, I got back on and reversed. And you know, she dropped right back on the rails. Boy, was I lucky. Then I took her ahead again, tentatively. And this time she cut right through and I was off. A few days later, the snow cleared a bit. And you know, there were these big gouges in the pavement and nobody could figure out how they got there. Strangest thing. After the abandonment of the Longwood Loop, we could only run the older double end cars on Aberdeen. See, we used to stop in the middle of the road at the TH and B underpass and change ends. Now nobody could forget their handles, but I'm embarrassed to tell you how many times I left with a trolley rope jiggling in front of my nose. And I wouldn't want to tell you how far I got. I'm only glad the car was empty as often as it was. The Aberdeen line was originally abandoned in 1941, but wartime traffic was so great that it was reinstated in 1943 in order that replacement buses could be better utilized in other parts of the city. At the time of filming this portion of the line, only traces of the former radial lines could be seen. Talks about the complete replacement of streetcars with buses had begun as early as 1934, as civic officials believed the trolleys impeded automobile traffic. During World War II, however, ridership doubled and later reached such levels that records were established that would never be equaled. In spite of their service during the war, big changes were in store for the system after the war. In 1946, the HSR was sold by Ontario Hydro, this time to Canada Coach Lines, who proposed a five-year modernization program that would affect the remaining 75 streetcars and alter the transit map forever. The 1946 sale to a private company would maintain the tradition of the HSR never being municipally owned. Canada Coach Lines wasted little time in announcing the abandonment of streetcars, but by some quirk of fate, the cars were repainted in Canada Coach two-tone green colors, and in addition, a complete set of new route linens was installed. John Mills's vintage color movies capture the flavor of the times, as Operator 399 recalls the trolley heydays. After heavy rain, there were several sections on Burlington that could end up under more than a little water. Rarely enough to stop the cars, but frequently enough to warrant caution. I remember after one particular downpour, I bullied a young kid into getting off and walking ahead of me, to plumb the depths, so to speak. But after only a few steps, and unbeknownst to me at the time, slipping on a tie, he disappeared under the murky water. After locking my brakes, scared, I jumped off the empty car, only to find the water was less than a foot deep, barely enough to wet my shins but just enough to hide the skinny body of my volunteer it landed flat in his back. He sat up soaked and laughing when I rounded the front of the car. Beltline cars, Aberdeen, Westdale, heck, most of us ran through King and James. You know there used to be this big fat cop, who shall remain nameless, who directed traffic at the corner. And I swear he'd see you coming, read the route sign, and deliberately stop the flow, so you couldn't set the switch so you'd be forced to use your iron when you got to the corner. Sometimes they used to send us to wait on Gore Street to do an extra. One day I took a car, I was supposed to sit there, then make a trip on Aberdeen when an inspector came and got me. Well, I waited and waited and nobody came. Finally I got tired and sat down. And you know, I don't remember falling asleep. 
But when I came to, it was pitch black out. I'd been there over four hours. The only thing I could think to do was just take the car back to the barn. I was sure I'd be in a lot of trouble. So I just signed it in, empty fare box and all, and snuck out home. And you know, I never heard a word about it. Nothing makes you feel better than getting overtime for a nap. In 1959, the HSR general manager announced the conversion of the system to trolley buses. And on August 4, 1949, car 504 made the last Westdale run, with 529 being the last car on the Burlington line, December 8, 1950. By 1951, the car fleet had dwindled to 47, of which only 26 ran. The last Beltline car ran in the early hours of April 6, 1951, ending almost 60 years of electric streetcar service in Hamilton. Cars 515 and 529 were decorated, and special tickets were sold for rides to the abandonment ceremonies at King and James, the site of the opening of the electric streetcar era. The surviving cars were stored on the Birch Avenue open track for several months in hopes of being sold to another transit property. But no one was interested, so in 1951 they were sold for scrap and were cut up in 1952. Hamilton was the second last city in Canada to set up a trolley bus system. Its first 48-seat Canadian car Brill trolley coach made its debut at the Hamilton Industrial Fair in late summer of 1950. Cannon Street was chosen as the first trolley coach line because its proximity to the car house made it easier to test the new vehicles. Opening ceremonies coincided with the closing of the Burlington streetcar line. Initially, Hamilton's trolley coach routes followed the old streetcar lines. But by the 1960s, when a one-way road system was introduced, routing changed. As the years passed, routes were extended further east to serve the growing suburbs. Operator 399 reached his days as a trolley bus operator. Okay. Cannon was the oldest, shortest, lightest patronized, and without doubt, the toughest of the trolley routes to drive. Just to turn down Houston Street, you had to straddle two lanes to manage to trip the switch and avoid running the back tires over somebody's feet. At the same time, of course, pedestrians ricocheted between the Wright House and Kresge's right in front of you. Turning on to Wilson, you had no protection from onrushing cars. It was years before they installed a traffic light to help you. Strathern Loop is as typical of Cannon as any feature. The entrance switch was sharp, requiring a slow speed turn. Then there was a long dead in the wires crossing the Roxboro lines, and a bit of a dip as you entered the loop. In the winter, the city would send a plow along Roxboro and plug the mouth of the loop with a wall of snow, making short turning an extra challenge. Moving slowly, you'd coast to a halt just where the poles would end up on the dead which gave you two choices. Call for an inspector to push you, or pull both of the ropes out of the retrievers and walk the poles around to the front of the bus to get power. Neither of which might work, because the dip and the accumulation of snow in the loop could raise the front end of the bus just enough so its rear bumper would be too low to line up with the cruiser's front. And worn tires on the rear wheels often meant even if you had power, you didn't have traction. The Roxborough Loop was built in the early 1950s when the Cannon Line was extended from Kenilworth Avenue. The extra large brills were bought to handle the heavy passenger loads on this former gas bus line. It was heavily patronized early on because riders used the line to avoid the slower streetcars. In 1960, when the city finally bought the HSR, it was extended east to Reed Avenue. But as time passed, ridership declined as overall bus service became more balanced. You can see one reason why the Cannon route was selected to be the first trolley route. You literally went out the gate and into service. The King and Barton lines originally followed the former streetcar routing and looped on James Street. 
When the one-way street system began in the 1960s, the loop was moved west of James twice to serve the new city hall before finally being located at the present-day McNabb Street site. Service along King Street eastbound was always fast-paced. Because of the great distance between King and Main, between Gage and Wentworth, patronage on the westbound portion of the King Line in the AM rush hour was greater than eastbound in the PM rush. Most riders would find it more convenient to take the Cannon route home from downtown. The lighter eastbound traffic would result in operators laying back downtown and racing the coaches down the line to make up time. Sometimes two coaches would run together in trains, but could not pass one another because they were on the same set of overhead. The fact that these type of buses could not pass one another would later be an argument the politicians would use to get rid of them. An express set of wires down the middle of the street could have been a solution, but it was never discussed. As the busiest route, King service was always frequent. Just not usually this frequent. You know, if it wasn't a few years too early, I'd swear that's the Flying Dutchman following me. During this time, the trolley bus lines funneled riders from their homes within the city to the downtown business district. Most people worked and shopped in the downtown core. Hamilton was a people-oriented place, full of hustle and bustle. The Barton Line, which was nearly as busy and ran as often as King, also turned in front of City Hall. They ran east on Main and north on Houston into a siding beside Kresge's. Power off in, power on out. The Barton Line was the slowest line in the system, and schedules were hard to maintain as the coaches would get tangled up in traffic on Barton because it was a two-way street. On Houston, they shared the Cannon overhead and had their own trolley bay with separate overhead, so the Cannon coaches could pass. They then would proceed down Houston to Barton, turn right, and proceed outbound to Melvin. East of Strathern on Barton, the trolleys turned south on Walter, then east on Melvin, outbound. Probably the main reason for this was the residential development on Melvin. There were a lot of houses and apartments built along this stretch, while Barton, paralleling one block north, was largely commercial or light industrial east of Parkdale. These old brills, they were just great. Fast, Great heater in the winter time. The only bad thing about them was no right-hand mirror on the outside. You could never see how close you were getting to the curb. Always scrubbing the tires, pulling in. Heading westbound on Melvin and turning on to Parkdale, there was a bad switch at that corner. Sharp, you had to be real slow or your poles would come off every time. By 1970, it was apparent that the Brills had reached the end of their service life. About 1971, the Toronto Transit Commission decided to rejuvenate their fleet. TTC Flyer 9213 was sent to Hamilton for a demonstration. The HSR ordered 40 new Flyer trolleys in 1972 so they could retire most of the old Brills. They were the first buses the company got in the new yellow and black paint scheme which also happened to be the team colors of the local football club, the Tiger Cats. The company saved a lot of money on these buses by salvaging and repairing parts off the old Brills. Most of the electrical gear that went into these buses came out of the Brills. In 1973, all 20 Thunder Bay Brills were purchased by the HSR and scrapped in Thunder Bay. Their motors and controls were sent to Hamilton for use in the 700 series flyers. One of the nice features of these buses, particularly turning down Houston, was that you could feel the notches in the power pedal. So you could give it just enough power to keep the poles from going into the Barton siding, and not so much they came flying off when they hit the switch. Of course, when I was driving Barton, and a friend of mine was out on Cannon, I used to like to play a bit of a game with him. While I was stopped at Kresge's, I'd leave my poles out in the main line so he couldn't turn the corner. 
Then when I left, I'd let them shoot in on the cannon siding, as I did whenever possible. You see, at King William, the dead was on the main line. The siding was live, so crossing the street, you could avoid a jerk if you pulled out from the siding. Before the King Line was extended to Don Avenue and Stony Creek, the buses regularly operated to Reed Avenue, east of Parkdale, or here to Strathern. There was a power switch on the eastbound line, power on to turn at the traffic circle, and then a siding where you got to take your break facing west. Then it was back downtown to do it all over again. Power switches have sensors that activate them. This power switch has a broken sensor. Watch what happens. Now with his no generator light on and a buzzer ringing in his ear, he knows he's got a problem. His headlights of course stay on thanks to battery power. After he puts the poles back up, he can get on his way again. The HSR's interest in these coaches was very favorable. Because of their performance, 18 Western Flyer Model E800 electric coaches were bought in the spring of 1979 to increase the fleet for route expansion. They had improved seating, visibility, superior heating, and they also had more driver comforts than the older models. These were the first electric buses to be 100% electric engineered and not just a diesel bus with electric gear. The new coaches provided the extra buses needed for the King Route extension to Stony Creek that had begun in 1975. The Stony Creek extension was one of the rockiest episodes the HSR ever had. Its attempt to extend electric service was thwarted by classic NIMBY politicians who wanted nothing to do with the electric buses and their ugly wires. The community was saved when the HSR decided to stop the service just short of Gray's Road and loop the buses in a field. The service portion of the loop was the driveway located in Stony Creek, while the private portion was the loop located in the city. No passengers were carried beyond the sidewalk. When the Eastgate Transit Mall opened in the mid-1980s, it became the transfer point of all Stony Creek routes. Since the King Route east of the mall duplicated service, it was cut back, and Stony Creek politicians rejoiced at their victory over the dreaded electric threat. When the King Line was cut back to the Eastgate Mall, the Queenston overhead east of the mall was cut off and eventually removed. At its maximum, the HSR had 18.4 miles of electric trolley bus overhead. The 7800's interior sported blue double and single aisle seats and double stream rear exit push doors. HSR management expressed a desire to rid the city of trolley buses as early as 1988, citing recent developments in compressed natural gas bus technology. It was argued that new electric vehicles and infrastructure would be more expensive than CNG buses. This fact would not stop the HSR in eventually investing a substantial sum on new overhead and support poles for the system. A dual-mode articulated trolley bus demonstrator with both electric and gas power capabilities visited Hamilton in late 1986, and while the public and drivers reacted favorably to it, none were ordered. In the mid-1980s, it was increasingly apparent that the Midtown Wentworth garage was inadequate for the expanding bus fleet. In 1984, the Mountain Transit Garage opened, and in 1988, construction began on the Wentworth Street Transportation Center. In the same year, the HSR equipped the 167800s with auxiliary power units to permit off-wire running in the street and at the new Wentworth Garage. The motor generator unit was located in an engine compartment at the rear of the bus. 
The hold down hooks that latched the trolley poles when they were off the wires were modified to prevent short circuits. And to add the sense of non-permanence for the trolley buses, the Bell Manor Loop was never paved. In 1990, the HSR moved into the new Wentworth Transportation Center, and during this Bus History Association tour, the wire configuration for the trolley bus entry into the yard can be seen. The electric buses operated to the end of the wire, and a pickup truck would then push them into the yard, as the garage had no indoor overhead, except for a little in the shop area. More than 20 electric buses were needed for service on either the King or Barton routes. So after the move into the new garage, the HSR no longer had enough trolleys to cover a single route. The lines would be supplemented with a mixture of diesels and electric buses. The phase-out program made it easier for the public to get used to riding the diesels. The HSR never repainted the electric buses in the new regional colors, and they remained in their Tiger Cat colors to the very end. The 700s were retired in 1990 and stored at the Mountain Garage and eventually scrapped. Quietly, without notice or fanfare, Hamilton's electric era came to a close at Christmas 1992. The 7800s were moved to the Mountain Garage, stored for a while, and were later scrapped. Over a year later, the overhead and poles that had been put up a few years earlier were taken down at night and sold for scrap. The Cannon Line, Hamilton's first electric bus line, was dieselized and was the first to have its overhead removed in April of 1993. And by the summer of 1993, there was no evidence that Hamilton ever had an electric transit system. Operators would no longer have to worry about losing their poles when they turned on to Maine. Hamilton's buses still travel downtown, but like the electric trolleys, the Kreskys and Woolworths stores have disappeared, and so have the downtown shoppers, as traffic now just passes through the downtown core to the suburban malls. Electric transit served Hamilton well for over 100 years. And it remains to be seen if the next 100 years will be just as well served by these environmentally friendly natural gas buses. Hamilton's electric heritage can be viewed at the Halton County Radio Railway near Rockwood, Ontario.